Good morning, everybody. We are going to get started. Um, I want to first thank everybody for joining us. I know there are a few of you where it is ungodly time frames. And so thank you again for joining us. My name is Christina Baxter, and I am going to uh, chair this and talk to you about things we can do to protect our uh, critical infrastructure. Background on me, I work in the fire service emergency management as well as the defense community. And part of what we're doing here is talking about the emerging threats and ways in which we can try to mitigate, at least in partial ways, that threat and try to minimize its impact on us as a group. Uh, I'm going, I own a company called Emergency Response Tips. And so I partnered with ProEngine and I'm gonna turn it over for Scott to introduce himself from ProEngine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I have to apologize a little bit for my voice. I'm fighting a cold. It's, uh, my voice is actually, believe it or not, much better than it was about three days ago, where I had to use a little app on my phone to communicate uh, with it. Uh, so just to give you a little background about me, I'm the CEO of um, ProEngine Inc. And I do have a fair background as far as infrastructure protection. So I spent a number of years um, helping to protect various um, critical infrastructure, um, primarily against a lot of explosives and blast um, mitigation aspects. So some of the uh, the same principles relative to chem and biological apply in this case as well um, to be able to do that. So ProEngine is a leading manufacturer of both um, chemical and biological detection capabilities. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how it can be used to provide a holistic approach for um, protection of infrastructure. Okay, the way that we have set up this webinar is going to be very similar to what we've done in the past. So first off, we have just a little bit of information um, about where you can find this information. Most importantly, this webinar is being recorded. So just keep that in mind and we will uh, follow up with registrants about how you can access that video. So if you don't catch something the first time through, I know for many of our partners, um, English is not their first language and I tend to speak really quickly as well as Scott. So we are recording everything and we'll make it available to you as a recording afterwards. We have set up the webinar in terms of first section talking about the emerging threats, where we sit today in terms of threat, the second section being some different solution sets that we may be able to apply to that threat. And then the final section being, what are some of the operational objectives you can do to get ahead of the threat and to make sure that you're placing sensors in the right places? So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my camera so you don't have to see me looking at you the whole time and save you that bandwidth. And we'll come back on with our cameras when we get towards the end for questions. So one of the things that you can always do is go to proengine.com. And that's where a lot of information about past webinars, this webinar, um, technical notes and application notes about the technologies we talk about and the threats that are out there. And keep in mind that the ProEngine Academy, while it is owned and managed by the company ProEngine, in a lot of the training materials in the webinars, we talk about a broad swath of technologies. So it's not just about that one size fits all, it's there's a whole lot of different things that we need to do to approach the threat. And they're all there on that one website. So I'm gonna start off with what is critical infrastructure? So one of the biggest issues that we've had over the years is defining where we need to spend our resources. So when we start talking about the chemical and biological threat, there's a lot of different things that we can kind of rule out pretty quickly. So dams, not really something that I'm gonna be focusing in a lot, but I will need to focus in a lot on government facilities, critical manufacturing, the chemical sector, obviously the defense industrial base, food and agriculture, because without our food and agriculture, we have nothing if we cannot support our people and their ability to uh, sustain life. Emergency services, nuclear uh, reactors. And one of the most important that we end up in is transportation systems. And so we're gonna talk a lot about these different parts. And while there are 16 sectors to 
critical infrastructure, we're really going to focus in on about half of those. So why does this become such an interest to me where most everything I do is defense related or national security? And part of that is that with the types of materials we're talking about, they can be both technological or accidental, or they can be adversarial. And when we start talking about that, I have a high interest in both those things that are just spills, technical, you know, chemical spills, releases, incidents or accidents, but also acts of terrorism. And so when we start looking at those, we have to start thinking about not only those things that have a terrorism nexus or a terrorism intent, but also those things nowadays that come from the drug community and actually transition over into being hazards to our national security. So while there are a broad range of things, all of them seem uh, to have interest here. Now, being from Florida where I am, just thinking about the severe weather events recently in Hurricane Ian and the disasters that it put us in harm's way, which was just the movement of chemical threats to areas where they weren't originally and the release of different materials that could cause more harm. So all of these things play a role. And when you start looking at CBRN defense policies and the policies that we need to have in place, just remember that it's all about building up your resilience, but also about having that integrated um, approach. We can't just have an approach where we have first responders and military personnel going out to meet the threat. We have to have some type of early warning system to be able to tell us that there's even a threat exists or that there's been a change in the environment that kind of is leading us along that edge. So what we're talking about here is the ability to protect to warn or the ability to protect to protect. We oftentimes just focus on that protect to identify range, which is a little bit farther out. We still need to be able to make decisions long before we have to identify the threat, but we need to make sure that we're aware of where the threat is and when the threat's coming to get us. And so when we talk about the current threat, I like to put together this little matrix and I start out with toxic industrial chemicals. Obviously toxic industrial chemicals pose a significant risk to all of us. And mainly that is from the accidental uh, releases. However, we also have to think about those intentional releases. Even if we just go back to 2017 and the last issue of Inspire Magazine back then in September of 2017, they talked about the use of toxic industrial chemicals against you and about trying to find, instead of chemical warfare agents and trying to bring those things into a country, instead focus on the materials that are already in the country and take advantage of the large volumes and different characteristics. So chemicals that stay close to the ground, chemicals that are heavier than air, high vapor density. So those types of things, chlorine and heavier, that are gonna stick close to the ground and actually push people out of an area. They may not have the same strength for killing that we have with chemical warfare agents, but they do provide that type of uh, information and the type of approach that people are looking for. Now, in terms of toxic industrial chemicals, it's about anything that's gas phase that can be released easily and taking advantage of in a certain area without having to do a whole lot of extra work. But in that toxic industrial chemicals arena, there also are the things like the binary devices. Remember, it was only back in um, Afghanistan where we were seeing hydrogen cyanide binary devices that were used outside of the air intakes into school rooms to try to keep young girls from getting an education. And those types of devices where they're producing hydrogen cyanide on the fly, when they're moving those chemicals, they're moving a potassium cyanide or a sodium cyanide salt and then mixing it in place with an acid. And in that case, they're producing the hydrogen cyanide gas right there. And those types of events are the things that we have to worry about. Now, as we get into chemical warfare agents themselves, thankfully in North America right now, 
I would say that most of us don't have an elevated threat for traditional chemical warfare agents outside of sulfur mustard. The only reason that sulfur mustard is considered to be an elevated threat is because it's so easy to make. You could actually follow directions in some of the different chat rooms and make sulfur mustard from things that you buy at the standard stores in the U.S. would be at the Home Depot or Lowe's, uh, Bunnings if you're over in Australia or Canada, Canada at Kent Hardware, those types of things that you're able to get relatively easily. Now, when we talk about the European arena, where I know a lot of you are joining us from, the European arena has a higher uh, elevated threat for all kinds of threats from mustard to sarin to VX. And a lot of that has to do with proximity to some of the state actors who may have those types of materials, as well as the ongoing uh, risks associated with the war in um, the Ukraine. So that does add a little bit of threat there for you that hopefully uh, those of us in North America are not seeing at this point in time. Remember, it was only in Syria that we saw these materials being used. Now, when we come across to the next generation of warfare agents, those considered pharmaceutical based agents or the non-traditional agents, uh, those types of materials do have elevated threats. But again, those ones are often very much based upon where you are. In terms of the pharmaceutical based agents in North America, we are seeing a reduction in the overall threat of, of the pharmaceutical based agents. And a lot of that has to do to the accessibility of pure materials. Pharmaceutical based agents are the highest threat when they're pure. And while about five years ago, we were seeing a huge influx of pure opioids and materials of that nature into the United States, we no longer see as much of the high purity materials. We've had a great reduction in that purity and generally see materials less than 7% pure coming across our southern border now. And so where we were seeing things that were 97% and higher in terms of those pharmaceutical based agents, we're not seeing that today here. But in areas of conflict, we still have to be worried about any of those pharmaceutical based agents. And I'm not talking just about the opioids. I'm talking about any type of material that has the elevated threat with it including anything that's used for anesthesia or for deep sedation. Okay, very much things that we would see as more of a hostage taking tool. Now, when we get to those fourth generation agents uh, or the A series agents, whatever you wanna call them, the Novichucks, again, the elevated threat there sticks close to uh, the European borders. And in that case, it's again, from the uh, proximity to Russia. Now, when we come into the biological threats, this is where we start to see a little bit more um, change over the last couple of years. Part of that has to do with the fact that we had COVID going around and we actually opened up to others to the fact that it was really overwhelming a lot of our systems. And when we have a virus that is easy to destroy, Overwhelming, our, overwhelming all of our systems, what does that say to our adversaries about what we can do with a standard biological threat? That then elevated the threat level because people knew not only were we getting low on supplies, but they were having a hard time with something that was a, a very minor in terms of uh, destruction threat. So now when we look at these, I divide them out into a couple of different classes. The toxins first, those ones are generally going to be solids uh, distributed as aerosols or um, going in as a injection type of threat. We see the highest threat talks about uh, the following toxins. Ricin, that's really U.S. Our folks love ricin. Abrin, mainly in the Asia areas. Botulinum worldwide. Nicotine is a huge influx in the United States. And I'm starting to see its influx overseas as well. And a lot of that has to do with the use of vaping devices and the fact that we can get high purity nicotine at high concentrations in all of those vaping devices. 
And then, of course, the saxa toxins or the red tide, red tide shellfish toxins, as well as tetrodotoxins or the puffer fish toxins. Those ones have reached a higher level again, mainly because the synthetic production pathways have been published openly. And there's a lot of research going on into these both of these types of materials, which tend to be paralytic toxins. And so while we look at all of these, I would say my highest focus would be on nicotine, ricin, and apron, just because of ease of access and ease of deployment. Now, we can follow that up with the traditional biological warfare agents. There is perceived to be an elevated threat today for these, which is a little bit different than two years ago, where we didn't see it as an elevated threat. This threat has been elevated mainly due to our response to the COVID pandemic. And so now we start seeing people talking about deployment of different types of materials. While most of those materials do stick to the toxin range, we do have to be cognizant of viruses as a warfare method, as well as uh, bacteria. Now, thankfully, on the genetically modified front, we are seeing a lot of interest in those areas, but most of that interest is still within the do-it-yourself biology, biological manufacturing in those arenas. However, we are seeing more and more people doing research on weaponization or of uh, dual use types of threats. So that's where we are currently on the CBRN threat spectrum. And of course, this is all from open source types of uh, areas. So not something that has gone down the full defense or uh, homeland security types of evaluations. Now, to get into chemical warfare agents as one of the threat areas, I wanna talk about the couple of types of materials that we generally work with. We have anti-personnel devices or materials that are meant to move people out of a given area or take them out of the game, whether that be temporarily or permanently. And then we have area denial types of materials. Those are kind of giving yourself that extra flank. So if you don't have enough uh, soldiers to be able to go into an area and cover all of your sides, area denial weapons are sometimes used. And these are things that tend to be very heavy and also very persistent. Things that will stay in that area for a length of time, which will not only keep your adversary from coming through, but also will keep your people from being able to go backwards. So we have to think about those in a little different way. But when we look at them over the years and start back with our first generation coming up to where we currently sit in the fourth generation, most of these chemicals started as gas phase. Now, as they got more and more use, they went to gas phase, but with a higher vapor pressure, vapor density, sorry, so that they would stick closer to the ground. Then you went into volatile liquids, things like sarin. Let's think back to Umshrinkio in the Tokyo subways. Sarin was a liquid that was deployed out of bags and let to uh, vaporize into that space. Now, today, we're seeing things that are mostly solids. And so as we start going out into that range, we have to make sure that we morph our detection capabilities along with the threats. So we're no longer talking about gases that come up to meet us or liquids that have relatively decent volatility, but that still stay close to the ground. Now we're talking about aerosols, true aerosols that we oftentimes can't capture very easily with most of our current technologies. And then with the area of denial, most of these things are oily liquids. Uh, and what's happening here is the volatility is going down and the vapor density is going up. And what's happening here means that while we are getting some volatility off of them, those vapors are sticking close to the ground and producing a true area denial type of approach. Sorry. When we get to detecting these threats, it's important that we look at how things have changed over the years. And in this case, we did start out with those gases and then we came down to liquids with a considerable headspace. Okay, so the G-series agents and even some of those early blister agents, while they were heavier and very oily, they could still come out to meet us in reasonable concentrations. But as we got up to things like VX, we started getting decreasing amounts of vapor available for exposure. 
And as we get to those A series agents, we're about 10 times less vapor availability. So it's really about interacting with that liquid, that oily material. But as we've gotten up to the final stage, the pharmaceutical-based agents, almost all of those, with the exception of two really well-known ones, are particulates. So we're talking about a solid material that would need to be dispersed in air, taking on the characteristics of a gas and its flow patterns, but also maintaining its uh, particle-based capabilities. Now, I talked about in the very beginning the fact that we are looking for uh, critical infrastructure protection really being in that detect to warn and detect to protect phase of uh, protection. What we're doing here is trying to find materials that will bring us down to that occupational exposure limit, that level that we can be in contact with throughout the workday without any adverse effects and bringing it up to that immediately dangerous to life or health level, where 30 minutes exposure may actually limit our ability to get away from the site on our own, and then up to lethal concentration, where people are going to be uh, dying due to the inhalation. Now, we don't want to throw out detect to identify, because that's very critical as well, but that's that second phase of infrastructure protection. And detect to identify here, this is where we can collect a sample, unless say we want to use a Raman spectrometer to identify it. This is where we can actually batch sample, take a sample from the air, constitute it down, and then go along and do a unique identification. But in the detect to warn and detect to protect arenas, we're really looking for something that is a continuous sampling, something that has a very short response time in the seconds to tens of seconds at the most. And then what we're looking for here is to identify where the source of the threat is coming from, because that's going to help us when we try to figure out how to shut down different uh, sectors or where to do evacuations. Very much things that we have to be thinking about in terms of uh, protecting our infrastructure and protecting the people within that infrastructure. Now, when we talk about the future chemical threats, it really is about those solids and aerosols. And a lot of these are going to be dermal exposure type of threats. And we start talking about those oily based uh, area denial. So we have to figure out ways to detect this and get that early warning type of protection in place. Now, I'm going to switch to bio for a minute because we're talking about chem and bio. The reality of the matter is, while there is a lot of research going in to next generation biological detection technologies, most of those are not forward technologies today. So right now, what happens is really retrospective. We are looking at symptoms of exposure and taking days to appear and then making a decision. So in terms of that early detection and the early warning, we need to figure out ways that we can determine that something out of the ordinary is happening. So for that, we generally look to trigger or cue to devices. So when you start hearing those terms, a trigger technology is generally based upon particle size. And so what it does is continuously monitors the background and says, we are now seeing a change in the background, which was not expected. So by the continuous monitoring, you can measure the diurnal effects, you can start measuring changes that happen just from day to night and changes between the different seasons. But what you're looking for here are changes that don't make sense based upon the background. And so what's happening is most particle sizing technologies are looking at that 0.5 up to 30 microns. And a lot of them will focus in on that 0.5 to about 10 microns, which is that area in which we generally breathe in. And so they're the inhalation hazards. Now, a lot of trigger technologies are partnered with another technology, which is, again, nonspecific, so real-time monitoring here. And what we're looking at there is a cue system. And so a cue system is just added on to the trigger. So the trigger divides things out and says, hey, something's here. And then the cue says it fluoresces or it has characteristics that are consistent with different types of biological threats. That Q system then automates a sampler, which takes a sample, which you would then use with your traditional biological uh, sampling technologies, 
which are batch technologies, so amino acids, PCR types of polymerase chain reaction types of detectors. Now, why do we focus in on the particle sizing? The main reason behind that is the size of the threats that we deal with are generally in those ranges. Now, we do see viruses being much smaller, but the viruses are usually carried by something else to be able to move throughout the air, or they just kind of float, okay? So to be able to be breathed in, viruses are usually piggybacking on something else. And so that something else is what we're breathing in. So by focusing on that breathable range and size, you end up getting the particles that are respirable that will build up and cause the dose in the body. And so I'm gonna stop here on my uh, detection range, but I'm going to go in and turn it over to Scott and have him talk a little bit about some of the technologies to address these. And then we'll come back into how do we operationalize this information. Thanks, Christina. So uh, um, first, I'll kind of uh, give an overview of flame spectroscopy, and um, we'll talk about its ability to both detect chemical and biological threat materials. So what a flame spectroscopy process does is it uh, uses a natural phenomenon that occurs uh, naturally in air or naturally in science, which is if you expose materials uh, to energy so that energy can be in the form of electricity it could be in the form of an explosion it could be in the form of a flame what happens is the materials certain materials get excited um, and then when they relax they produce visible light so the visible light that is produced is indicative of certain materials and specific to that material and that material only um, so it allows you to um, be able to detect um, certain materials, compounds, or elements of interest that can then be used to be able to do there. In this case, what we're looking for in this aspect is critical infrastructure protection. So what you're really trying to focus in on, it's a little bit different than um, detection in a threat or a hazmat environment, for example, where you already know there's a threat and you're just trying to identify it and you have it in a, in a general local area. In the case of infrastructure protection, you're wanting to monitor something continuously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, a long, maybe the whole lifespan of the device, it may not see anything, and that's good because you don't have a threat that you're trying to protect against, but you're trying to monitor to it. So the technology that you need to choose, some technologies are really good for you know, your point, your incident, and being able to do some of those. Um, not all detection technologies are good for running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and just sitting there looking for things. Um, in this case, flame spectroscopy is actually a pretty good um, use of that. Um, from, from the standpoint, it doesn't have any um, issues with humidity, changes in temperature, changes in humidity, um, pollens, uh, environmental materials that are coming in there. So it can be used in, in an outdoors environment. Um, to be able to be able to detect things. So if you go to the next slide, we'll kind of walk you through kind of how the, the process actually works. And so we have a video here, which fingers crossed, you never know with videos. All right, here we go. So this is what, if you were to take out any sort of um, flame spectroscopy detector, um, this is kind of what's occurring in the inside. So the, the, the secret part in the inside of the detector. So what you see here is a first chamber because in some cases you're using flammable materials, um, this first chamber protects the device or keeps the um, materials, if you, uh, if you do have flammable materials, from bringing a flame outside of the device. So it's kind of like a silencer on a weapon. Then you actually see where the flame is. And so what you're doing is you're bringing in an airstream and you're exposing it um, to the materials. In this case, uh, that we're using a hydrogen flame. Like I said, you could use different types of flame. We're using hydrogen because it's a very consistent, um, long burning, and hydrogen's one on the periodic table. What you're seeing here is indicative of different materials going through, and they're getting a unique color associated with those. That, material, that light is captured through a series of lenses, and then you're using solid state electronics. So those solid state electronics are focusing in on the full visible spectrum, and they're looking for the specific fingerprint of the materials of interest that you're wanting to look for. So as we talked about before, each element has a unique um, light specific to that material and that material only. So that allows us to delineate between other materials. And so you can click on the next slide, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about how that works. 
you just want there we go so what you're seeing here is what we focused in on that video is kind of in the center of that where you have the hydrogen and the flame um, and then you're collecting the information and analyzing it um, in the case of chemical detection um, what you're doing is you're just bringing in the standard airstream going through that process and then you're looking for core materials so for your historical chemical warfare agents if that was your sole concern with it you'd be focusing primarily on phosphorus which are your organophosphate based materials then also hydrogen nitrogen bonds which are in your nitrogen mustard gas they're also in your opioids um, and they're in some um, binary agents like uh, hydrogen cyanide your arsenic is in your lewisite and arsenine gas which has historically been used as a chemical warfare agent and then your sulfur which is your your um, mustard gas or your blister agent. So between those four channels, you can get a, a large percentage of all your chemical warfare agents. The only exception would be uh, chlorine, which chlorine, as you know, was the first generation agent, didn't really work very well because it's lighter than air. So it tends to want to um, go up into the air very quickly uh, and uh, you know dis dissipate from there. So with this, you're getting all your chemical warfare agents. Now, if you want to add your biologicals, what we do is we add an impactor. So what Christina talked to you about before was you're really interested in biological detection from around 0.5 microns to 10 microns, maybe up to 30 microns. So what we're doing in that case is we're isolating the incoming airstream and then just putting in the, the materials of interest or those particles of those size and filtering out the ones that we don't. So we use what's called a visual impactor. We have a couple different ways of doing that but there's, there's basically you're, you're centering or focusing in on your desired airstream and you're putting those materials through the flame spectroscopy process. In that case, with your biologicals, what you're interested in is other types of information. So you're looking for sodium, potassium, and calcium. So why do we choose sodium, potassium, and calcium? So if you go back to, um, we're trying to delineate between something that's living and non-living. So going back to our famous COVID vaccines, which are RNA vaccines, right? Um, RNA is the, when cells are replicating, there's RNA, which is indicative of life, or there's um, cells that are increasing in numbers. So in order for that process to occur, you have to have core elements such as sodium, potassium, and calcium in there. So we're looking at those materials and we're looking at specific ratios of those materials, and then we're doing biocategories. So when, when we're doing biological detection, what we're doing is every single particle that's coming through that's isolated to that 0.5 to 10 microns, there's a particle count, and then there's a particle classification of that. And the classification is a function of some of the ratios between the sodium and potassium, where we do into different bio categories. And so we're able to identify and delineate between a living and non-living particle. And then what you're doing with the other challenge with um, chemical versus biological as over a whole is chemical you're really looking for something that's normally not there so yeah I usually don't have a nerve agent present right so all of a sudden something's there I'm flagging for you in the case of biologicals it's very different you have biologicals all the time just because there's biologicals present doesn't necessarily mean that there's a threat per se um, or, you know, I got exposed to a biological and it happened to grow in me and now I have a cold, right? So we also have those. So there's bad cold things and there's things that are really bad, such as smallpox or other types of biological agents. What historically will happen is there's a purposeful release where there'll be a large increase or of materials that aren't a normal occurrence. And that's what you're trying to look for. So you establish a baseline. In the case of biological, one of the challenges of it is the amount of biologicals present will vary based upon your location, time of year, and other things like that. So, for example, if you were to sample the amount of biological activity in Florida in the middle of summer, it's going to be drastically different than in uh, Alaska in the middle of winter. Um, so there's just a certain amount of biologicals that will occur naturally with it. And some of it is our climates are more conducive um, for certain particles to exist. And then the presence of the number of humans, right? So there's a whole bunch of humans. We are very good carriers and transmitters of biologicals. And so if there's a lot of humans in a place, you'll tend to have a higher percentage as well. So what you're really trying to do is establish a baseline, and then you're looking for any sort of rapid change from that or any, uh, any sort of steady state change that's 
beyond what's normal and then you want to flag and so there there's where some analysis needs to be done on your algorithms in order for you to delineate between um, how you go about doing that and that's part of the science um, with biologicals that kind of makes it a little bit different makes it different than chemical but also makes it somewhat challenging as to where to figure out where that is next slide please so um, ProEngine has a variety of different types of solutions with it. So uh, we have chemical specific ones and we actually have the ability to do biological and combine chemical and biological. So um, in the case of what we talked about with the chemical and biological, the main difference between some of the materials, the V or the F, um, so the V is kind of designed for vehicle applications, the F is designed for 24 hour, seven days a week, operations so on the chips or critical infrastructure key points hvac inputs to be able to do that we also have an mab which is designed to be a biological only detector um, but then you can add the biological components to the existing chemical ones in the case of the vb and the um, fb where we're just where we're doing both so in, in those cases you're just adding those filters as we talked about that the particle isolators and then adding in more processing capabilities because you're looking for additional channels of information. So you just need a faster processor to look for those additional materials simultaneously. So that's kind of the delineation between all of those um, materials. So the technology, uh, place petroxide in particular, is kind of an interesting one in the fact that it can simultaneously do both chemical and biological in the same airstream at the same time, which is kind of a unique aspect of that in comparison to other technologies where you kind of have to choose one for chemical one for biological and you kind of combine them in the cases they're all together into one next slide please so we'll just talk a little bit about the ap4cf um, and then we'll go into some of the data of testing so next slide so that's what the f looks like it is a little bit bigger than um, what you've seen on um, some of the other things so the F is designed to, to be a system that runs 24 seven. So it is a little bit larger size, not significantly larger, but in the case of um, the reason why that is, is that, it, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, is it has the ability to, gen it generates its own hydrogen. So you take about a quart of water is all you need per month, and you're just simply using electrolysis. So you're, you're taking H2O, you're taking H2, and using that for your detector and you're releasing oxygen into the atmosphere so it's kind of eco-friendly you can make an argument with that it's so it's designed to be rugged utilized in harsh conditions so it can be raining or other types of environment um, and it's designed to sit there and be alone so the only thing you need to do is pump a, a quart of water in there once a month and uh, as long as it has electricity it's just sitting there 24 hours a day um, seven days a week next slide please there there we go so um in the case of the the sort of things where you're wanting to be persistent surveillance you don't want to have to to go there and, and touch it every week or every day for example with that right you want something that you're putting it in a location that's a key location a lot of times you may not even want to know that um you may not make it want it to, to be very obvious to people that you're going by a sensor right because you don't want to let people know that have malicious intent where your critical points are that you're um, being able to, to um, you're trying to detect them, right? Um, so you try to do that conspicuous. You don't want people going there and inspecting it or having to work on it. So all you need is to just put in, a, like we said, a, a quart of water um, every month, which takes a matter of seconds. And uh, then you just have to do operational maintenance on it every two years, but it's designed to sit there and run for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you have the ver variant that's can bio combined, you're getting a lot of your non-traditional agents, your chemical warfare agents, your fourth generation agents ability to do that, um, mixtures, precursor materials in there, as well as a large percentage of the IITF 24, 25 um, hazardous materials in there that are being able to be done. And then we also have made the design to be um, decontaminatables as well with that. Next slide, please. So, an additional aspect of this is a lot of times with, with chemical, um, when you're doing like monitoring or response, a lot of times people are most popular thing is to have a handheld, right? Because you have it in your hand, you can put it where you want to do. In the case of infrastructure protection, 
you're wanting to put it into critical point and then monitor it back into some sort of area where it's safe. So we have solutions where there's visualization tools that you can utilize as well as an open architecture so that you can include it into existing building management systems. So the picture that you see in the middle there, um, uh, you can't, I don't know if you can see my, there you go, thank you. Um, right there to the right is the AP4CF that's sitting there and that's an input to a HVAC system. So as we learned with, with the Chechnya and Rebel incident where they released car fentanyl into HVAC system or just in general HVAC systems are attractive targets, especially on um, areas of interest, right? Because it's a central point where you're collecting air and then you're distributing it throughout the building. So if you wanted to attack an area of interest, HVAC systems are an attractive thing because in one central area, you can release it and then it does all the work for you, the hard work, which is getting it out to the to the rest of the facility. So those are why you're being able to do this. This particular is, uh, I can't say specifically, but generically, I'll give you a description of this. this is a large central building where a lot of people like to come in Brussels. And so this is an area of interest to be able to do there. So this is sitting there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's tied to the building management system. In the event that there's a chemical or biological threat, um, this building in particular actually has a collector protection system. So it switches over to the collector protection system, which is has the ability to still um, operate the and, and cool the building or heat the building in the event of a thing and it going through a special filter that's ChemBio proof to be able to do that. Um, so that's one example of, of how it could be utilized to um, envision of this type of system for a protection of critical infrastructure. Next slide, please. So the MAB is our standalone detector, and we have some data on this, so I'll, I'll go into the next slide. If you click on that, please. So the MAB is a biological specific one. Um, so uh, the main differences between our systems, they're using the same core technology as far as the flame spectroscopy in there. Um, some of the differences between our devices is how we're doing the filtration, so the isolation of those particles. The MAB has the I would say the, the the most precise means of being able to to do that, and so that's where we tend to get our best biological performance um, in the device. In theory, it could have the ability to do ChemBio, but in this case, it was just designed to be a bio only one. But in theory, it could be added if it needed to be um, added into the system. Next slide, please. And so, as part of what Christina was talking about before. Um, a lot of existing biological systems that are used involve really the sampling and the analysis part of things. So there's just a lot of a lot of the ways of doing it. For example, if you take the BioWatch program that's utilized in the United States, that's that's monitoring in different areas. There's a sampling process that's defined, and it's independent of any sort of triggers. It's done, and then the analysis is is um, taken with it. Where the challenge with some of those is um, you don't want to, uh, most of the, the samples that are taken, right, are showing nothing of interest with our, so one of the areas where the AP4C technology or claims spectroscopy in a whole can help is it can be that upfront component, if you go to the next slide, that lets you know when to start and where to start and to be able to do that. So if you add that into the system, what it can do is it's letting you know that there's some sort of an abnormality there in order to then take a sample and then go through the analysis process. So in some cases, those analysis, I mean, those are not cheap tests to be able to be done. So if you have a means of sitting there and saying, hey, something weird is occurring here, um, something that's not normal, then you can take that sample and then you can analyze it. And um, it saves the number of samples that you have to do. And it's just another set of data in there that you're looking for um, to be able to do there. So I, in some cases, you can set up your sampling devices to actually look for particle counts too. Um, so that can be done. In this case, what we're doing is we're delineating, you know, living and non-living. So we're giving you an additional set of information. So you can trigger off of us, or you could trigger off of your sampling device or a combination of it through whatever algorithm you want to use into the process. So next slide, please. So, um, biological detection with this. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about sensitivity. So some of you are probably very familiar with this. Some of you may not have heard about this. So I'm going to go into it a little bit. There's a term that's used for these things, which is called ACPLA. So ACPLA stands for Agent Containing Particles. 
per liter of air. So that's where you get the ACVLA. So the way to look at it is it's the number of particles in the air which contain a viable biological agent. So if there's more, if, that, if the number is higher, then that means there's more materials present in the air to be able to do there. So we use that as a measure of sensitivity. So in the case of chemical detection, a way of looking at this is that detectors have what's called a limit of detection. So it's what, what sort of level can they detect at? So a lot of times that's in parts per billion or milligrams per milliliter squared or some cubed. So it's a measure of what's our sensitivity? How sensitive can we get down there to when we see that? So in the case of biological, you have the same thing. So different sensors have different sets for ACPLA. So with ACPLA, the lower the number means that the detector is able to detect a smaller number present in a liter of air of biological materials to be able to do there. Now, just because there is a certain number of biological materials present, similar to your chemical threats, um, doesn't necessarily mean that that is harmful or not harmful, right? So it's so dependent upon what the material is kind of drive the threat profile of that specific thing. So there's not, you know, if you just say, if you were just to take everything, we're saying, okay, I'm going to trigger on two parts per billion for chemical warfare agents, which is super sensitive to be able to do your nerve agents. Well, you'd be triggering all the time if you were trying to look at nitrogen mustard or um, somin because the, the level of, of what you need that starts to cause a meiosis on the human body or start to show it would be much higher. So all that is, is when we say ACPLA, it's a measure of sensitivity of the device. So as a general rule, you know, lower tends to be better, but obviously if you get super low, you don't want it to be triggering all the time. So there is a trade-off associated with that, but then you also have to tie it into the threat material that you're, you're seeing um, to be able to do that. And then to add an additional complexity into all of this is the amount of biologicals that will result in someone getting sick. So just because we're exposed to something doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get sick from it. And so that's a function of how healthy our immune systems are and the nature of what's being attacking us. And then what is our natural immunity that we have? And then how is it being, you know, just because it hits my body, it really a lot of times has to go through my respiratory system and then find a nice place to start replicating itself. So that's an additional area of complexity with biologicals is it's a little bit harder to set certain trigger levels associated with them. But regardless from a detection standpoint, what you're trying to identify is you want a detector that has sufficient sensitivity for the threat profiles that you're trying to, to do, um, as well as it's not going to have a lot of false positives or false negatives. So another challenge with biological protection in particular um, is a function of some of the technology you're using. So if you're using fluorescing, for example, as your means of detection, if, those if there are a lot of materials that fluoresce, so you have to be able to delineate between good and bad fluorescing, or, or are you getting a false positive because you're getting fluorescing from, from materials such as um, uh, you know exhaust from diesel particles, or there's actually obscurance that um, nation, that large state, actors know how to utilize to thwart or to compromise um, some of the things. So an additional advantage of flame spectroscopy is it's not necessary, it's not subject to fluorescing issues like a lot of the other technologies are, or um, diesel or smoke, which can also be used to inhibit and um, to be able to um, hinder some of these things with it. So it's kind of a, just a little bit of an initial overview on kind of biological detection and things to take into consideration with that. So next we're going to go into a little, some samples of some testing that we've done. This is not the complete set of testing that we've done, but what you see here is a setup that's done. Um, so we did this in tandem with the Swedish Army. So you see um, that what in the red circles are two of our MBA, MAB detectors that are set up. And then um, there's a bunch of other equipment, other uh, manufacturer's equipment. And then so what in, in, happened in this case is there have been there are purposeful releases of different surrogate materials. So a lot of cases we we don't want to use the actual materials because we don't want to get everyone sick. But we use surrogates of materials that aren't harmful to the humans. But you aerosolize them and they behave similar exactly the way that um, many of these harmful agents would utilize. And as Christina talked about, this is a it tends to be an aerosol threat, and you're releasing those. And um, 
in addition to that, they have particle collectors that are doing there. So they're just looking for the particles. So you can go to the next slide. I'll show you some of the same data with that. So what you're seeing here is the first test. So this is a vegetative. So this is a vegetative, or I'm gonna butcher the name so you can just read it because of my voice, but it's biological simulate for bacteria. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So what you're seeing is a release of there and you click on there, you start to see some of the data that comes up over time. So what you're seeing is three data points. So the, the forced, um, remember we, we had two different detectors. So those are shown as the yellow and the, uh, the magenta color in there. And they're this showing you what the detectors are reading. And then there's also the, the um, there's a slit sampler that's looking for particles that's collecting the particles. So the, in the case of this is that each specific agent has a unique particle size. So the, the sampler was designed for the particle size of the release of the materials with there. And so what you're seeing is a correlation between a steady state of where you're looking at, all of a sudden a release, some rapid occurring of, of agents is doing, and then you're wanting your detector to alarm. So in this case, we're alarming, um, you're seeing within really less than uh, three minutes of release of the agent, we're alarming because they're letting you know something not natural as occurring as should be done so it's in this case the detector is doing what it's supposed to be doing and you're also seeing the particle collection as far as um, knowing what the sampling of the device downrange as well is correlating with that as well next slide so this is um, ms2 so this is a virus simulant so the same thing is going to kind of occur we have both detectors and then we have our um, particle size analyzer with it so you're seeing the release of it, and then you're also seeing the alarm of the device to be able to do there um, with those devices. Uh, next slide, please. So these are BGs, so these BG spores. So these are spore-related bacteria. Um, and then these also have a fluorescing interference in them. So trying to up the ante. So we one of the things we talked about was that um, sometimes with these materials, they're you can put in other things to obscure them. So in the case of what you're seeing there is the uh, the alarm of it. So it took a little bit longer. You can kind of see, uh, I don't know exactly here, you see a release and then it goes down and then a release again. So sometimes when these are dispersed, they aren't necessarily homogeneous dispersals. Um, so when there was a longer duration of it, um, we tended to see those. Next slide, please. Again. BG spores with an oil fog, so another design to be an obscurant. Again, you're seeing the response of the detector and um, of the particle collector, and then you're seeing an alarm with that. So that's occurring within a matter of just minutes. Next slide, please. So this is also, um, this is designed to be uh, a false negative event where you're releasing of diesel exhaust. So that would tend to be a fluorescence. If you had a fluorescence technology, it would tend to trigger it and be an interferent. In this case, it did not trigger at all. So it's showing you in the, the event of a hydro, high hydrocarbon release of a diesel exhaust, there would be no false positives releasing of it. Next slide. So that kind of um, shows you some of the, the general principles of that. Um, the, the FB is the, the product kind of choice for a 24-7 operation. Next slide, please. So these, these are primarily um, used in naval and infrastructure applications um, with them. So we, we do have some inactive use um, in the United States. There's a number of throughout the world in key areas of which um, by the nature of uh, those areas, we can't really come out and say what those are, especially in there, but they're designed to be able to detect bacteria, virus, and toxins um, to be able to do that. So your toxins will primarily show up on most of those that Christina talked about as well, because toxins kind of um, get linked in with biologicals, but they, in many cases, they're more detectable on um, chemical channels to be able to do that. So a combined chem bio detection in this case would get you those protection of um, of those releases as well, and it you want to put these into key areas where there's collection points or where it'll be collection of people, um, so they make attractive targets, right? So if you're a terrorist, you're wanting to do release, 
you're going to try and get your most bang for your buck. So you're trying to get access to as many people as possible. So, or you're trying to attack a certain area of national interest um, that has either strategic importance um, from the standpoint of there's um, you're trying to disrupt that nation state. So you're trying to attack leadership or of an area of, of high importance, strategic otherwise. So it, it could be anything such as like a major airport or a train station or a location where there are a lot of people that go through there where the com we're doing commerce tends to be an, an important part of the economy, right? So if you can disrupt that, um, you can put a lot of fear into people. And so being able to look at those key points where people are gathered or held or um, choke points where a lot of people are constantly congregated at tends to be an attractive thing as well as your, your air handling and other things like that. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of those applications. Next slide, please. Um, with those, so um, I'm kind of getting a little bit ahead of me, but kind of the main uses that we've seen are on um, you know military basis to monitor that, monitor airfields, for example, government buildings, um, so palaces, government palaces or headquarters, um, capital buildings, other things like that, mass transportation hubs. So in the case of mass transportation hubs, it could be uh, monitoring of the airstream into the HVAC system. It can be monitoring of critical choke points. So maybe a narrower area where a lot of people congregate or in the case of airports, like where people are checking in, going through TSA, um, especially the terrorists are hoping that TSA is not running efficiently that day, which could be a lot of days as you, those of you traveling, right? So you can monitor in those financial centers as we talked about to disrupt commerce, um, to be able to do their economic headquarters, things such as like the UN where a lot of uh, world leaders get um, held or brought to one place. And then also looking for your your critical infrastructure as far as water, electricity support um, to be able to attack those areas. So you can attack the workers doing the work or to actually um, compromise the, the materials through the introduction of them, for example, into the water supply. Next slide, please. I think this okay, is where you, you go back in, right? Yeah. And so as Scott just talked about, a lot of the transportation hubs, financial centers, uh, federal buildings, I add in sports arenas and stadiums just because of the sheer number of people. All of these things are the types of areas we're talking about. And I like to look at it from, I know Scott talked a lot about fixed point detection solutions. I think there's also a need for portable solutions as well. And so as we come into these, I set up just a couple of different examples of where would we put different sensors for fixed point and then where would we use that portable detector as well. So in these cases, we're talking about just airports. So in terms of sensor placement, it's really where are those, choke, those choke points. So uh, check-in and baggage claim areas, mainly there main, due to the limited security measures. So. In both of those areas, in most airports, you can come and go freely from those areas without going through any type of major security type of uh, capabilities. So in those cases, we need to be able to do background measurements just because they're gonna change more frequently due to the influx of external air sources, but also because we have limited security there and we need to take uh, notice. Security checkpoint would be the second area. And when I talk about security checkpoints, I'm talking about both for passengers and for employees where they're separate in some cases. And in that case, we just have to remember that we have had insider threats in airports uh, for many years. And in fact, in just the last five years, we have had cases with uh, illicit drugs, explosives, all of those things that were insider threats in airport facilities. So the last one, obviously, is within the terminals in the areas of convergence or choke points. And where I look at there is kind of a combination of areas just inside of security where people tend to be getting their things back together, areas where you have different walkways that may uh, cross because that's where you see the confusion in passengers on finding their way through an area, and then the areas near the flight boards areas where people are looking to find out where their fight will be. 
And the reason behind those areas is specifically due to the larger number of people in a smaller area. And then of course, you can't forget the departure gates for high target regions. Sometimes those are flights coming into the Middle East or flights coming into the United States from different areas. And so when you start getting to those flight areas where they have their own security, those often tend to also be higher target areas. But there's things that we can do. If we were to have a way to give us that early warning, you can isolate the specific air intakes. And so in airports, they're generally not an entire system or in terms of the system, it is areas where you can isolate out different us sections of the ventilation system. So in that case, you're really just isolating out the areas where that chemical or biological may be. Implementing evacuation protocols to make sure that the people that are in that area are moved from that area, whether that be out to um, areas on the tarmac, which you try to avoid, or back out through security areas. It's all gonna depend upon the level of material and what type of threat we're seeing. But in parallel, deploying officers with portable detection solutions is critical to verify what's going on and if possible, isolate the source of the threat. Okay, and then initiate the air exchange systems. In this case, we have to remember that air exchange systems, how they work. Part of the problem we have in many of these is that they work by using makeup air instead of a complete reflux of air. And so if you don't refresh the air completely, then you're just continuing to spread the threat material. In this case, you have to override the system, make sure that it's bringing in all fresh air and that all bad air is being sent to a waste stream. That can be problematic because you have no way to condition that air. So oftentimes the reason you use the makeup air is to minimize uh, the impacts on the system. So if we already have cooled air, then we're only having to cool a quarter of the air versus 100% every time the air comes through. So different things that we need to do there. It gets a little bit different when we get into subway systems. And part of that is because we have to take into account the areas, so the station platforms, the subway cars, the station air intakes, but we also have to take into account the dispersion that occurs from the movement of trains. So depending upon what type of system you have, there are systems that if you're just looking down the tunnel, you'll see ones where the train car fits almost the whole tunnel. And what happens there is you move plugs of air. Whereas the systems where you see the train car, the subway car, and then you see large open space, they work by mixing. And so all of these things occur, but you've got to figure out the ways to take advantage uh, of your ventilation system. It wasn't that long ago, and I mean, for some of you it may be, but for some of us, we very much remember exactly where we were in 1995 when Amshrinkyo attacked the subway system in Japan and being probably the worst uh, event that we've ever seen in a subway type system. And in this case, um, depending upon the date that you take the measure, 12 to 14 people died. Many were injured and had life altering experiences. And then many more deployed to hospitals, in essence, shutting down an entire system due to worried well deploying. In this case, you have to be able to isolate the, the specific air intakes or shut down the entire system. You've got to stop the movement of the oncoming trains because if those trains move, we end up having those plugs of chemical moving throughout the system versus staying into that one area where we might be able to ventilate out the effects. Deploying officers here is gonna be critical to get, to again, isolate that source of the threat. And then remembering how to ventilate the space. It's just as important to remember how to ventilate the space inside the, the cars as it is inside the platform. And then having the added influx of most subway systems are in major cities. So if you're trying to evacuate that space in terms of ventilation, you've got to think about where it's ventilating to and trying to ensure that you don't cause a larger problem um, than what you have. So ventilation may not be something you can do immediately. So you've got to figure out how to evacuate everybody, but still minimize the flux of the chemicals outside of the system. 
Now, when we get into buildings, I know Scott brought this up earlier, but when we talk uh, about buildings, it's all about the air intakes and the main entrances to the buildings. The air intakes, thankfully, many are up high, but with the added uh, input of drone technologies lately, it's no longer able to just isolate by saying, hey, we're putting up the ventilation system, air intakes high up in the air. Uh, main building entrances, especially the areas where people congregate, elevator banks, security lines, all of those areas become also high priority for measurement. Now, if I remember back to, to my times of doing some of the measurements, and we did some in both buildings and in, well, subways and airports, a lot, oftentimes the detectors that we were using back then, and I'm talking only in the mid 2000s, uh, you know, 2006 to 2011 or so, most of the technologies that we had available for us at that point in time were only able to tell us why the person was already dead. They weren't able to measure down to the limits of detection we needed to actually give us that warning that, hey, something is going on that needs to be taken care of. Now, if we go back, and, and Scott had brought this one up, in the Chechnya crisis, the rebels in the Russian uh, theater, where they released carfentanil and remifentanil into the air handling system. Now, in that case, it was an offensive use by the tactical team to try to take out the, um, out of action, let's say, the hostage takers. And in the same time, that knowing the hostages would also be taking in this chemical, it was not thinking that you would get as good of a dispersion as they ended up getting, uh, but it tells us a lot about where the problems would lie. And in this case, many people died, and most of those people in hundreds died mainly due to positional asphyxiation and not having the appropriate things in place to deal with it. Now, in this case, remember, it was an intentional use by officers of employing chemical threats into the air handling system to resolve an incident. Same type of thing could be used from the opposite side where they are trying to take advantage of uh, people using an air handling system like that. When we do that, it's all about shutting down that ventilation system, minimizing the spread, diverting the recycled air in older buildings, that's not gonna be a, a possibility. And so you're gonna have to shut down the entire system and try to open up doors and things, making sure again, that you're not spreading material outside. Implement your evacuation protocol, protocols, deploy officers if at all possible, and then try to ventilate that space prior to returning to normal operations. In this case, there's gonna be a whole decontamination process that has to occur. Now that top right picture is the uh, US Capitol visitors area, an area that we often have congregating people in issues where we often have to worry about um, operational because it's not necessarily a building that has any financial importance, but it's definitely of importance to all of us from a strategic perspective because those types of buildings are high profile. Now, when we start talking about this, as you start building your plans, it's really important that you have those clear and realistic building goals. I think the program that was put forth, I mean, is that back in 2007 they did this, so you're talking 15 years ago, but very well done by the National Academy of Sciences. So building protection systems have to be designed case by case. And mainly that's because all of the buildings have different structures. And just because one solution set works for one building, it may not work for another. That's gonna be very dependent upon the capabilities of the air handling system, the way the air flows, as well as the entrances and exits of the building and all of those things need to be considered. The other one to consider, and I know we're supposed to not talk about cost and things, but life cycle costs of a system like this is critical. If we go to just using systems that are continuously taking samples, kind of like we do in BioWatch, we end up spending huge amounts of money for little return on investment. What we really need to be going towards are systems that trigger and say, we are in a unprecedented type of event. We've got a background change that is causing us to need to take a sample now and go from there. But reality is you need to design everything to be able to accommodate the changing building conditions and the changing threats. So if you have a technology that is not able 
to be uh, threat agnostic, meaning that it isn't future proof, then you have a problem because you're going to have to modify or change your technologies every time a new threat comes in. So when we just look at the chemical perspective here, just looking at the fact that in the first three generations of chemical warfare, we dealt with gas phase threats, whereas the fourth generation, we're dealing with particulate threats. We need technologies that can deal with both gas phase and aerosol type threats. And there's very few technologies that can do that today. From the gas phase um, realm, reality is you're, you're relegated to the flame uh, spectrophotometer from AP4C, or you can use the MX908 system, but that's not gonna be continuous. Now, the other thing to remember, and this comes from the uh, Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense in 2021, is that we are in a time of increasing risk. And as we talked in the threat section earlier, as we started seeing more and more open communication about our failures with things like COVID-19, we ended up opening ourselves up to a little bit more of a problem. And what we're looking at here is the ability for others to come in and overwhelm our systems by using a biological type of threat, further weakening our resources and our capability set. And this is something that for me is uh, comes right to the heart because it's something that we've been dealing with and trying to avoid for many years. Now, when we start thinking about this, what I want to remind everybody to do is that that protection side of it, what do we do after the alarm? We can modify very minor changes between what type of infrastructure we're dealing with because we're still going to work on minimizing the spread by shutting down and isolating ventilation systems. We're gonna work on getting people evacuated from the space, from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. And we're gonna to try to send in officers with the appropriate protection to then try to isolate and identify or localize the threat and minimize the spread there. And then we're gonna end with some type of ventilation. Yes, it's gonna be different based upon the building, the infrastructure type, but the same process can be applied throughout. We have to remember that to get to that point, we need some type of detect to warn or detect to protect posture. Detect to treat, which is where we are today, is just not enough. That's where we do random sampling and send it to the lab and identify uniquely where the, what the threat is. But the cost level has become so astronomical it's just not sustainable for long term. If we look at it from a chemical perspective, we need to look at continuous sampling at minimal cost, fast analysis in the low numbers of seconds, ability to measure gases and aerosols, and look at that broad range of threats, having a system that's future proof, that's easily modifiable, and has a low logistics burden. When we look at the biological side, I like to think of it as kind of the biological smoke detector. Continuous sampling again, very fast analysis. But in this case, we're triggering the collection of a sample by looking at changes in background. We're optimizing that sample collection to minimize the overall burden of both time and money, and then still having a low logistics burden. So reality is, to me, that's where we are today. We need technologies that can do that detect to warn and detect to protect in place in our critical infrastructure so that we know when something is occurring that's outside of the ordinary. I'm going to stop there and let you know that we will provide um, a link to the webinar. So ProEngine will send you an email with a link to this webinar. And we are working on a white paper that will go with it, but that's not quite ready because I'm still writing it. Uh, with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. So if you have questions, there's a question section on there or raise your hand and I can try to unmute you. So with that, thank you very much and we'll open for questions. Okay, well, if you don't have any questions, then we will um, shut down the webinar for today. Please look forward to an email back from your uh, our partners at ProEngine, Scott and um, Gautier is also on here today helping us.
And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out via our emails, which are on the screen. And then both Scott and my cell phone numbers are on here. And as any time, we are more than willing to answer your questions. And we hope that you all enjoyed the presentation. And thank you very much. Have a nice day. Stay safe out there. Thanks. And we'll hope Scott gets his voice back for the next one. <laughs> yeah, I hope it's so as well. Bye-bye, everyone.